This is a machine shop. And when I inherited this machine shop from my grandfather, I decided to share my story of learning how to use these tools again through various projects. Now a big part of sharing this shop and these projects is to capture them. On camera. A camera attached to a tripod. And I don't know if you know this, but tripods suck. They're all prone to endless fiddling with leg extensions, fixing tilt locks, and finding secure footing. And the setups can get a bit questionable. Like this. Or this. Or my personal favorite. This. After over a year of working with this camera rig, it's honestly a matter of time before one of these setups comes crashing down. And frankly, I've had more than my fill of tripod tomfoolery. It's time for a change. It's time for a camera gantry. I want this gantry build to be the end-all be-all solution for my tripod headache. So I've been building up a list of requirements, which looks remarkably similar to my list of grievances. First and foremost, it needs to be easy to use. No legs, no knobs, no levers, no nothing. Just move and stay. Like this lamp arm. Actually, this design is pretty much exactly what I'm going to make. Only much larger and much more robust to hold my somewhat beefy camera. It will have a central pivot at the base, I'll call this the shoulder, then two pairs of arm tubes that sandwich between plates at the elbow and wrist. A simple bar at the end will let me mount an articulating ball head for the camera, and a series of tension springs will help balance the weight of the camera and the arm itself. Then, just to make it that much nicer to use, I'll include nylon bushings at all the pivot joints. The second requirement for this build is that it needs to be able to reach any position in this shop. From end to end, front to back, floor to ceiling, everywhere. And it needs to stay out of my way. I can't even count the number of times I've kicked a tripod leg mid-shot. The only way to really do this is by suspending the arm from a ceiling gantry. To make this gantry, I'll use some off-the-shelf strut channel and trolleys that are more or less intended for this kind of thing, which means there isn't a whole lot of design work needed for this part of the build. Actually, after playing around with a scaled assembly drawing of the arm components, I'm convinced this is enough to work from. Almost all the dimensions are even values, and none of the tolerances are particularly critical. So I'm going to do the unthinkable and just use this single sheet for all the machining to come, which should be interesting. Now I have a lot of work to do, so I'm just going to jump right in. And might as well start on one of the more complicated parts, the handle. Which, despite my cutting out a piece of square steel, will actually be mostly a round component. Going this route, though, will save me from turning a lot of good metal into chips. The first step is to mill the four long sides square to one another, but I'm not going to bother with the ends quite yet, and you'll see why. Next, I'll stand the bar up in the vise and use a precision square to get it within a thou or so of vertical. Then I'll center drill the end in what will be the central axis of the handle, and do the same on the other side as well. Then it's over to the lathe. I'll start on the bore end, and since it's off-center, I'll use the four jaw chuck. I can eyeball the bar close to alignment with the tailstock, then switch to an indicator running on the machine surface of the center drilled hole for the finer adjustment. With that dialed in, I can face the end and drill the starting hole for the threads. Doing both of these operations in one setup ensures that the top mating face is perfectly square to the thread axis, which will be important for even load distribution on the shoulder pivot bushing. Now I can bust out my recently made spring-loaded tap follower and tap the bore of the handle. One last thing before breaking down this setup is to cut a simple groove with a parting blade. This will give me a good reference for indicating this handle back in when I work on the other end. But before I do that, it's back over to the mill for a few more operations on this end. First is the drill, tap, and counterbore a screw hole for the locking collar. Then I'll switch to the slitting saw and cut the clamping slit. But, as I soon discovered, it isn't quite large enough to make it all the way through before crashing into the spindle. Fortunately, I do have a larger blade of the same thickness, but because my saw arbor doesn't have a centering boss, making it run true takes a little creativity. I've found that with the arbor only slightly snug and the spindle running in reverse, I can carefully press a piece of wood against the blade, then slowly back it off until the blade runs true. 
After tightening the arbor fully, I can finish the slitting operation. That little collision before left a bit of a blemish on one corner though. So a few quick chamfers make this problem disappear while also generally making it look cooler. And while I'm at it, I might as well cut away some of the excess material around what will be the handle grip. I need to grip this end in the fore jaw again. So to make sure I'm not collapsing the collar, I'll run the tap in this end of the handle. This of course can be done with the bolt as well, I just don't have one of the fine pitch thread I used here. Then with the tailstock supporting the far end, I can again use the dial indicator on the groove I turned earlier to realign the part, and start turning this square bar down to a round shaft. This interrupted impacting load isn't the best thing for carbide tooling, which has a tendency to chip, but a button insert cutter is a little more robust, and the larger radius also seems to help ease the interrupted cut since the tip engages before the sides, making the impacts less abrupt. Once past the outer square profile, I can switch to a regular diamond insert to take this to final size. Then, it's time for some knurling. If I'm being honest, using this knurling tool was no small factor in deciding to make this handle in the first place. A simple lock nut to hold the shoulder in place would have sufficed. But I'm a sucker for a nice sharp diamond knurl. The last bit to take care of is the end. So remounting in the three jaw chuck this time, I can face this down past the center drilled hole, then bring in a large radius form tool to round the end. After a little polishing with emery cloth, that's the first part complete. But it's the first of many, so no time to waste. Next is a simple aluminum boss for mounting the pivot shaft to the drop tube that will extend down from the gantry. And the tube is just a piece of inch and a half EMT conduit I had laying around. After facing the end, I'll turn down the diameter to what would be a few thou press fit into the tube. And to ease the assembly of this press fit, I'll file a slight lead in chamfer on the end. The bore is also a press fit for a pivot shaft I'll make later. So after drilling this out, I'll ream it to a precise diameter as well, before flipping it in the chuck and facing and turning down this end as well. And of course, chamfer the outside edge. Easy peasy. I'll keep this ball rolling and jump right onto the pivot shaft. This is a long piece that I'll turn all at once, so I'll first face and center drill the end, before bringing in some tailstock support. It's going to be somewhat important that I have a consistent diameter along this shaft so that the bushings are a nice fit. So after a skim pass to check the tailstock alignment, I can give the tailstock a slight adjustment to bring it back true. And with that sorted out, I can begin turning the features. First, a press fit diameter near the base for the boss, a slip fit along the majority of the shaft for the bushings, then preparations for threads on the far end. And if you're wondering, this is exactly one of those camera angles that would be a couple orders of magnitude less sketchy once this gantry is complete. With the bulk of the shaft turned down, I can then start cutting threads on the end to match the threads I put in the handle earlier. And just as a sanity check, I'll make sure the locking collar is actually going to work. That's pretty much perfect. After a little polishing up on the rest of the shaft, it's a perfectly smooth fit for the bushings which means all that's left is to part this off and clean up the other side. I'm making pretty good headway on this shoulder joint. I've got all the stuff on either end taken care of. Now for the middle bits. I'll make the shoulder body from this oversized block of aluminum I had. So the first step is to mill it down to size. And since my largest regular fly cutter is slightly too small for the job, I'll have to bust out the heavy artillery. I'll get the cutter and counterweight adjusted to a more appropriate diameter set up for a 50 thou pass, and send it on its way. Whoa, look at that. What in the Davy Jones locker is going on here? Okay, 50 thou might have been a bit extreme for a single fly cut pass, but other than summoning a sea beast from whatever depths this aluminum was mined from, it seems to do just fine. Just in case though, I'll take another lighter pass before moving on to the other sides. Yeah, a freshly fly cut face never gets old. After cutting the other side down to thickness, and fly cutting the other four faces square into dimension as well, I'm ready to move on to the other features. First is a long bore for the bushings. I'll get the block set up overhanging the edge of the vise and use some material on the other side to balance out the jaws. Then begin drilling through the length of the bore with a slightly undersized drill. This leaves about 15 thou to clean up for a nice fit with the bushings, but I don't happen to have a reamer that's the correct size. So to open this up the rest of the way, I'll need to use the boring head. 
First a skim pass followed by a spring pass to measure my starting diameter. Then a few more medium passes and a finishing spring pass until it's a perfect friction fit for the bushings. I see an opportunity for some chamfering, so I'll get this set up at a 45 degree angle with some angle blocks and drop some nice meaty chamfers on these two edges as well. Then laying this flat, I can start work on the two pivot holes for the arm links. After spot drilling for the two hole positions though, I'm going to do one small thing that will help me later. Inscribe the rounds I'd like to add to these corners using the spot drill as my pivot point. Then from here it's just drill and ream the two holes like normal. One last operation on the mill is to cut the pocket that accepts the two arm links. I'll first hog away the bulk of the material with a roughing mill, then switch to a ball end mill to take the pocket the rest of the way to width and depth. Putting a fillet at the bottom of the pocket like this does eliminate stress concentrations that could cause the part to crack, but seeing as this is very unlikely in the first place, this is more of an aesthetic decision. And an excuse to use a ball mill. With the pocket milled, that just leaves the two corners to round. And to cut these, I'm going to do something very uncharacteristic for my projects, and just grind them on the belt grinder. I know, shocker. This is normally the type of thing I would use the rotary table for, but considering the time it would take to get that all set up, and that these rounds aren't even remotely critical, grinding these is just too irresistible. Plus, after some finish sanding, you can hardly tell the difference anyway. I also went ahead and turned up this simple washer, which was about as straightforward as you'd expect. Which just leaves one last thing to do before I can assemble this shoulder joint for the first time. And that's to clean and square up the end of the drop tube that receives the boss. Which is a perfect job for the lathe. This leaves the working end dangerously unsupported though. Fortunately, I have just a solution for this. A steady rest. I'll get this bolted down on the ways, bring in a bullnose center on the tailstock to center up this end of the tube, Adjust the three pads in until they're just touching the surface and put a little oil on here. Then back the tailstock out and face the tube to a nice square end. Repeat this on the other side and now I'm ready for some assembly. First is to press fit the pivot shaft into the aluminum boss. And then I'll adjust my setup a bit and push the boss into the drop tube. The flanged bushings slide easily into the shoulder body. Then this and the washer slide onto the pivot shaft. And lastly, the handle is threaded on to hold it all together. That should do nicely. Now to make everything else. Starting with the elbow and wrist plates. I have four to make of two different designs. But there are some similarities, so I'll work on them sort of at the same time. The widths are all the same, so I can clamp all four in the vise and flat cut these two sides to size. Then I'll separate out the elbow plates and clamp them in the vise horizontally. And I'll insert a piece of thick cardboard on the moving jaw side. This helps maintain suitable pressure on the top plate since as the vise is tightened, the top of the jaws have a tendency to open up a bit under the forces. From here I can mill the third side square to the first two, then move right onto the top spot drilling the locations of the four holes. I'll again use my little radius scribing trick to mark the rounds on the four corners, before drilling and reaming the holes to size. The wrist plates are much the same, except after milling the third edge square, I'll also come in and partially mill the fourth edge as well, before scribing the rounds and drilling and reaming the holes. Now all four of these parts have one angled edge that runs tangent to the rounds on the corners, and it wouldn't be that difficult to do the trig to find that angle and set these up in the mill, but I have a quicker way that doesn't need any math at all. Putting shoulder bolts through all four plates I can simply clamp this stack in the vise placing parallels under the shoulders of the bolts, which sets them right at the angle I need. Pretty neat, right? From here it's just a matter of milling away the material and stopping once I'm tangent with the scribe lines for the corner rounds. The wrist plates get a couple more 45 degree angles cut on them as well, so after cutting away the bulk of the material beforehand this time, I can again use the shoulder bolt method with some angle blocks to set these up in the vise and mill these down to the tangent lines as well. All right, that just leaves the rounds to tackle, but since I don't have scribe lines on all the plates, I'll again use shoulder bolts to stack the plates while I round the corners on the belt grinder. After manually cleaning up the rounds on a higher grit paper, the plates are finished. Next, I'll make the camera post that mounts between the wrist plates. 
After fly cutting some stock square into size, I can drill and ream two mounting holes that match those in the wrist plates, then rotate the part to drill the hole for mounting the camera. And might as well do a countersink here just to keep it all low profile. Now this would work fine for what I need, but it's still kind of heavy, and also kind of boring looking. So to kill two birds with one stone, I'll drill some weight reducing holes through the side, and also mill away some of the excess material from the end. Then naturally, chamfers all around. That's much better. I'm getting pretty close to having an actual arm here. Actually, up next are the arm tubes themselves. I bought some six foot lengths of three quarter inch square aluminum tubing for the job, but they don't quite fit in the bandsaw. So I'll have to cut them the old fashioned way. This leaves the end somewhat rough though, which I can clean up with the end mill, but I'd also like for them all to be reasonably close to the same length. So I'll set up an angle plate to act as a makeshift work stop, which lets me cycle through each of the arms as I mill them down without having to adjust anything. I just have to set each tube against the stop before locking the vise down. It's the same process for spot drilling each of the pivot holes, but before I drill the through holes, I'm hammering in some nylon blocks I milled down previously to be a snug fit into the ends of the tubes. These will prevent the ends of the aluminum tubes from collapsing over time from the pressure of the pivot joints. After then reaming each of the holes, I can move on to the final task of rounding the ends. I don't want the block inserts to shift though, so I'll hammer in the sleeve bushings, and rather than round these on the grinder like the other parts, I'll head back to the mill where I've drilled and reamed a hole in a scrap block to accept the shoulder bolts. This allows me to simply swing the end of the arm by the end mill to form the round. Perfect. Now I can just cycle through the rest, and that's all the links complete. I still have some spring mounting hardware to make, but with so many parts piling up, it only seems right that I should test fit everything. You know, just to make sure it's all going to work as planned. Each side of the arms gets a nylon thrust washer that fits over the sleeve bushing, then these are held in place with a shoulder bolt and lock nut. The elbow plate gets attached the same way, then the wrist, and lastly the camera mount to hold the ball head and the camera itself. Alright, I can say one thing with certainty, this thing is absolutely massive, but I love it. Just from where it's mounted on the workbench, I can reach both the mill and the lathe, and get shots way down low at the ground as well as up near the ceiling. And as you may have already noticed, there's already enough friction in the joints to support the weight of the camera without the need for springs. But I feel like not including those is just asking for trouble. So I'll contain my excitement for now, and whip up some mounting hardware real quick. They're pretty simple with a major diameter matching that of the pivot bushings. Then the ends are turned down to a couple different diameters. One to accept some threads, and a smaller one where a spring locating groove will go. I'll just use a die to quickly cut the thread since there's no need for high precision here. Then I can part this off and repeat the same features on the other end. After making one more of this size, then two more of a shorter length, there's just one more step before getting these in place. And that's the cold blue them. This puts a black oxide coating on the surfaces, which when combined with the penetrative sealant, will not only deter rust, but more importantly, match the rest of the black oxide hardware. While I was at it, I also went ahead and treated the handle as well. And I gotta say, I'm extremely fond of the combination of knurling and cold bluing. It just looks so sharp. All right, let's get this all together. The longer spring bolts I made actually replaced the top shoulder bolts from before, one in each joint. And then the smaller bolts get placed somewhere along the bottom arm links. But I have to figure out where exactly before drilling any holes. So to simulate this, I'll place some small C-clamps on the lower arms that I can then mount the springs to. Then hook them over the mounting bolts at the joints. Since the friction of the joints is enough to support the camera by itself, I'll loosen all the bolts slightly so that I can actually see the effects of the springs, and begin making slight adjustments to the spring locations until the arm can support the camera in basically any spot I move it to, including the worst case scenarios of the arm fully extended and fully retracted. Once I'm happy, I'll mark those locations on the arms, then move over to the mill to drill the mounting holes. I'll do one last cleanup on all the parts with some Scotch-Brite before assembling the arm for the final time, this time using a little touch of grease at each of the joints to give them that buttery smooth feel. Then that's the arm complete, and as excited as I am about how this turned out, 
It's still only one part of my tripod solution. I still need to get it suspended from the ceiling. It's time to shift gears a bit and work on the gantry. While this will be mostly off-the-shelf components and hardware, there's still a fair amount of stuff I need to make. Only this time, the medium will be wood. So it's time to take a trip to my other machine shop. The machine shop on my back porch, that is. I've got some leftover renovation materials that will work perfectly for what I need. A lot of this will make sense in a bit when I'm assembling everything, but with it being January and literally freezing outside, I'm going to make quick work of these parts and get back to my warm shop. To start, I've got some simple blocks that will space the rails off the ceiling surface just a bit to clear the lights and whatnot. A laser level is the perfect tool for easily setting the blocks and the rails in a straight line. And even though my ceiling is entirely wood, I'm taking care to screw these blocks into the actual joists above. The last thing I need is for this all to come crashing down on my head, least of all while a machine is running. Hanging the channels by myself took a little figuring, but I soon discovered that if I partially start a pan head screw into the right position, I can then hook right through the slots of the channel and attach the other side. Then come back and screw the first in the rest of the way. The second set of channels is much the same, except I'm measuring right from the first set of channels to make sure that the two are parallel along the length of the shop. That takes care of what I guess I could refer to as the x-axis. The y-axis is a little different. First, two channels get attached to some plywood boards, one on each end to keep the rails parallel and square. Then, flipping the assembly over, I'll attach a pair of channel trolleys to the bottom, again on both ends, and making sure the spacing matches the rails already on the ceiling. Then, up this goes. Wow, that is way smoother than I thought it was going to be, and not nearly as loud. I'm starting to really get excited about this. Just one more thing to make. The carriage will be what the actual arm mounts to. It includes a baseboard and some gusset boards to rigidly secure the drop tube. I'm using some lengths of wood along the joints for two reasons. Firstly, because it's never a good idea to screw into the end of plywood. And second, because this will allow me to preload the joint somewhat, making it less likely to come loose over time. Next is to actually attach the camera arm to this thing. I'll get the drop tube off of here, then set it up in the mill and drill four perpendicular cross holes through the tube. Back over at the carriage assembly, I'll clamp it down, then use those holes as a guide for drilling through the gusset boards, and attach the tube to the carriage with some 3 8 hardware. I also bent some washers to roughly match the profile of the tube so it's less likely to collapse as I tighten this all down. Four more channel trolleys get attached to the other side of the carriage, then this thing goes up as well, and lastly the arm is reattached to the drop tube. Oh, and I'd better get the last two segments of channel up on the ceiling, and some simple stop blocks in the ends of the y-axis channels to prevent the carriage from rolling out. It would be really dumb to overshoot this and drop the camera on the ground. Now that is everything, and man am I freaking stoked with how this turned out. I'm genuinely impressed with how well it works. I started this build thinking there was a good chance it would be a flop, or at least just not be very easy to use. But no, this thing is so nice. The channel trolleys are super smooth, and the arm goes wherever I want it. I can literally reach everywhere in this shop, effortlessly. And it stays right where I put it. Just like I hoped. There's not a single lever, lock, leg, or anything to mess with. This is more than an upgrade to a tripod. This is an upgrade to life itself. Okay, maybe that's being a little overdramatic, but in all seriousness, this is going to be a real game changer for my shop. I feel like I just got a new machine tool, and now I can't wait to start the next build. As always, thanks for watching, and see you next time.